My name is Ask Elklit. I'm professor in clinical psychology, and I'm head of a center for psychotraumatology in Denmark at the University of Southern Denmark. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to introduce this by telling my own story, because many years ago I was physically assaulted, and uh, <clears throat> it took some time, but after four years I published an article about how is it to be a victim of physical assault? I call it uh, the social psychology of, of <coughs> physical assault and have a case story published. And to my surprise, I was uh, a lecturer at the university, at another university at that time. It created a lot of public attention. A lot of papers wrote about it. A lot of people contacted me. My colleagues came and forward and talked with me. The police came forward and said, could we do it better? And the hospital was interested in making changes. And I even visited the, the, one of the perpetrators together with a journalist to get his view of what had happened. And his view was that I had been the perpetrator and he just helped his friend. So that was very uh, enlightening for me. And some years later, I started a project together with two colleagues on crisis intervention, on how could you help people, rapes, victims, and victims of physical assault, could you do some crisis intervention that would help them do better. So that was how my life changed and I got into the trauma field. Here are some of the points I would like to talk about. Uh, rape victims and the system, I talk about child abuse victims and the police work, how to reduce domestic violence and help the children, how to work trauma-informed. I'll also touch upon how are police officers affected by their work, what can you do in disaster and terror situations for helping the victims, and a few words about psychiatric patients where you could include the collaboration with a <coughs> forensic uh, or psychiatric nurse or doctor in combination with the police work. So there are a lot of topics. I'm sorry Marla? to interrupt, but do we have to put another microphone as well? Uh-huh. <laughs> one for this row and one for the other row. Yeah, exactly. Is that so? Sorry. Does the sound bad? No, no. The sound is good. Okay. So, this microphone. To the other pocket? Yeah. <laughs> to the other pocket. Yeah. 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 So these are topics I will touch upon. <clears throat> Let's start with the rape victims and the background. Until some 20 years ago, uh, <clears throat> the treatment of rape victims in Denmark was very disorganized and insufficient. Victims had to find their own services in different locations in acute crisis situations. That means when they were in a very bad condition, very bad shape, they have to go to the police on their own, go to the hospital on their own, find all the help on their own. And <clears throat> they have to find psychological counseling if they need that and pay for it on their own. They had to risk re-victimization by encountering untrained personnel. And <clears throat> they risk long-term physical and psychological consequences due to lack of services and treatment. A lot of problems for this group. And if you see it from the inside, <clears throat> then uh, in most cases, in many cases, rape victims had had the fear of being killed. They have had the humiliation. They were kept down by the strength or threats from the perpetrator. They were penetrated when they didn't want to. Many of them felt betrayed because they trusted someone who let them down. They could be afraid of pregnancy or <clears throat> sexually transmitted diseases. 
and many of them felt dirty, felt like trash. Now I'll tell you something <coughs> that is for professionals. And you're all professionals here. And this is some knowledge that I don't go to the Danish newspapers and other papers and tell them about. Because this is very important knowledge, but it's also <coughs> critical knowledge in that way that we don't want to stigmatize rape victims. But when we study them through the Danish registers and through Swedish registers, we find they have a lot of problems as a group. That doesn't mean that every rape victim has a psychiatric diagnosis or other problems, but many of them have. So <clears throat> this knowledge, I think, is very necessary for professional people. And they are a little bit shocking. Because <clears throat> we studied the rape victims through the Danish registers of diagnosis, psychiatric diagnosis, and found that they had 19 times more psychosis diagnosis than the controls. We took every rape victim, and then we took <coughs> uh, like 10 other women of her age, uh, from the same municipality, and then we make comparison. And these women in the control group were taken randomly because we have the whole Danish population, so we could pick them up randomly. So that means that's a very strong control group. We found 10 times more anxiety diagnosis than controls had. We found <coughs> that they went much more to a general practitioner for all kinds of problems. But now, this is shocking in itself because there's so many people with psychiatric diagnosis that get raped. But <clears throat> after the rape, we found that the number of psychotic diagnoses went up by 10 times. So that means that the rape itself uh, <clears throat> meant that many more of the women uh, had a psychosis. 10 times. And for anxiety diagnosis, the increase was six times. And here is for <clears throat> Swedish uh, register studies of young people <clears throat> where they found that the suicide, suicide attempts went up by times 25. So a lot of them wanted to kill themselves. <clears throat> the alcohol abuse, serious alcohol abuse, went up by 10 times and more than half, up to two-thirds, developed PTSD. So <clears throat> this is a very important knowledge that this group of victims as a whole is very vulnerable and has needs professional help and very good help. <clears throat> By the way, I talked to Kaya. I would like some questions during my presentation because I don't know what you know. Maybe you know it all and you should say, tell me to talk about something else or maybe there are things that you don't know about and you want to have, to have me elaborate more on it. So I think this presentation will be a success if I get more than five questions. Three from this row and two from this row. <laughs> now, what do we know about rape? We know that uh, rape, most rape uh, happens with what we call contact word, rape, <clears throat> not blitz rape, that is from strangers, but contact. So about 70% are with people you know in beforehand. Maybe a partner, an ex-partner, maybe a friend, maybe someone you met <clears throat> at a nightclub or a bar, maybe a Tinder date, whatever, and then the rape comes. So about two-thirds are drunk and on drugs. We don't want to say that very loud, but that's what we know. <clears throat> and now I go back to the vulnerable point, because if you're vulnerable, having a diagnosis, having had contact with a psychiatry and so on, you're very likely to have friends with similar uh, problems. And we made studies in Denmark of, of perpetrators, young perpetrators, and we see that they have a lot of social problems a lot of problems with 
education and <coughs> work and so on. So, but even with a low life with a lot of problems, you deserve justice, care, empathy, and respect. I think we'll all agree upon that. And <coughs> you could sometimes think of the victim as someone who's close to you, your wife, your sister, your friend, and in that case, you will do more. Now, <coughs> the sad story is that rape is not the end. Rape is the beginning of a deroot that goes on for a long time. Kaya had told you about trauma, acute stress, and the psychological consequences. I don't know if, if she touched upon the serial time perspective, but I think this is very important that you see after the trauma has happened, a long uh, series of uh, subsequent events will follow. And we can take it here. <clears throat> you are inside. This is where the rape happened. <clears throat> you are perhaps fleeing. You are looking for help. Do you get that help? Did you get that help? Or didn't you get that help from someone around? <clears throat> Most people try to come home because they feel safe at home. And then they have a lot of considerations. Should they go to the hospital? Yes or no? Should they have a forensic examination? Yes or no? That can be very unpleasant. Should they go to the police and report it? Yes or no? Should they tell family? Some raped victims don't want to tell their family. Should you tell friends about it? Should you ask for a leave at school or work? What if the perpetrator was a classmate in the high school? Happens quite often. And you see him every day at school. <clears throat> Would you be on the media front page of the national papers the next day as a case, an interesting case? What about the police interrogation? Would that be a pleasant experience or would that be very painful? <clears throat> Are you going to the court? Are you going to ask for compensation? Would you have the rapist convicted? Would you go to a psychologist for therapy? There are a lot of steps that follow after the rape. And <clears throat> what steps are taken is depending on, on the rape victim, her situation, her resources, if people around her will believe in what she says, uh, <clears throat> if the perpetrator can be found and held responsible for what have happened. But a lot of these <clears throat> following steps are very uh, difficult and they have the risk of that you are traumatized a second time, secondary victimization. And this is not because people are evil, but it's because of how the system functions. <clears throat> Let us <clears throat> have some examples of what reactions can be from other people. It's not uncommon that family members would say, I warned you. I said you should be careful. And the meter message is, it's your own fault. Why do you dress up like that? Why do you go there? Why are you out so late? It's your own fault. When you come to the hospital, <coughs> you'll have to wait until all, all serious injuries are dealt with. And why is that? Is that because hospital staff is evil? No, because they have a, a list of priorities. If uh, someone is bleeding, if a leg is broken, uh, <coughs> if someone yeah, is very serious, then they are treated first. And the one who has smaller injuries and so on, they'll just have to wait. But the meter message is in many cases that your injuries are minor or is not, are not important. And when you come to the police, sometimes a police officer would ask some details about the, the, the acquaintance. Did you kiss him? Did you agree upon having sex with him and so on, because the police, of course, uh, has to be aware of that this could be a false accusation. That's part of their job. But the meter message with these questions are, we don't trust you. You are just a witness in a lousy case. 
there'll probably be no conviction. And if you go to other uh, partner parts, then you might be on the front page in the newspaper story, party girl accuses boyfriend of rape. And the media message is, we have an exciting story to tell and sell about how young people behave today, you know. You cannot be safe going out at night, but you know, some girls are very loose and they will accuse their boyfriends of anything. And in court you might meet the, the defendant lawyer saying, this girl has a bad reputation, she caused this alleged rape, but you know, she was probably the one who asked for it. So the meter message is, you are a liar, you just want to hurt my client. She had experienced the rape, and then someone tells you she is a liar. <clears throat> And the boyfriend might say, did you fight back? The meter message could be, how can I trust you when you didn't fight back? But the fact is that those who fight back, they get a lot of injuries and have a, a hard time because of that. They may avoid the rape, but they might be beaten very severely. And a girlfriend, stupid girlfriend might ask, did you get wet and had an orgasm? because the meta message could be a myth that rape can be like hot sex. It's just far away from the truth, but you can meet reactions like that. So that means that <clears throat> there are a lot of steps after rape where you get a lot of reactions from different people. And this means that in many cases that the, <clears throat> the consequences of rape are more severe because you have many negative reactions from everywhere, from the systems. And <clears throat> the police officers are not necessarily bad people. They have to ask questions, but the way you ask them at the time you ask them is very important because you might cause more damages if you're not aware of that the rape victim and other <clears throat> Uh, victims of violence uh, are vulnerable and need special treatment. So I was uh, a co-founder of the first Danish Center for Rape Victims back in 1999. And that built on uh, inspiration from the States and uh, the way it works is that you have a gate principle. You go through one door and then all the helpers come to you. So instead of you being assaulted and vulnerable and weak and felt uh, very bad and have to ask for help here and are there, then the helpers come to you. <clears throat> The police, the medical doctor, the forensic doctor, the psychologist, social worker, nurse, they all come to the center and help you. <clears throat> the model, uh, the center I've been engaged in is placed at the emergency ward because this is open 24-7. <clears throat> they have a special entrance, so you should not sit in the waiting room with all the other uh, victims of traffic accidents and all kind of problems. So there are special rooms for, for these services. Uh, and the nurse is the coordinator. She might call the police, she might call the medical doctor, she might call the forensic doctor, depending on what the rape victim wants. The rape victim get the offers. Would you like this? Would you like that? And then <coughs> the nurse who is on duty uh, or on call, can be there within half an hour. She will coordinate all the, the work. <clears throat> and very important is that there is a special attitude of being empathetic and warm because the person is in a deep crisis and you are a helper while you do your job, including asking about details for, as a policeman, 
What do you need to secure traces and identify the perpetrator? This is very important knowledge at an early stage of the investigation. So if the police can get it <coughs> within short time, this is what they want because the chances of identifying, finding the perpetrator is, is much higher. Now we know that many perpetrators are acquaintances, so this is not always a big problem to find the, the perpetrator. But um, even if you have to ask detailed questions, it doesn't have to be, you don't need to hurt the person. You can do it in a gentle way and be successful. And you're actually more successful if you do it like that. About a year ago, a year and a half ago, <coughs> the Danish police studied themselves what is the customer satisfaction with our work. And for many of the uh, types of, of crime, the number of people who are dissatisfied was quite low. But in two areas, for rape victims and for assault victims, there was high levels of satisfaction. Almost half of the rape victims was very dissatisfied with the police. This was a little shock to the Danish police because they thought they were so good. <laughs> but <clears throat> and what did they complain about? They feel that the police didn't listen to them, were critical, degrading, and had prejudice. You ask for it yourself, that kind of questions. So the police want to take action and took action. The Minister of Justice, they uh, <coughs> had a, an expert panel to give advice. I was a member of that panel. And during the, the <coughs> panel work, a new Danish uh, law section came that, I don't know if you have it here in Estonia, but the idea is that rape is non-consensual sex. That means if you have not consented, say, yes, I want to have sex with you, then it is a possible a rape situation. And the perpetrator, the illegal perpetrator, has the burden of proof. He shall uh, convince the police or the jury that uh, she wanted to have sex. And if he cannot prove that, then he's a rapist. So things have been turned around because earlier <coughs> the, the victim has to prove that she was assaulted. But now the potential rapist has to prove that she said yes, she wanted it. She consented to have sex with me. And this is really a game changer because <clears throat> everyone has to think in a new way. When you go out with someone and you are <clears throat> in an intimate situation, you have sometimes, if you don't know each other well, to be very sure, do you want to go to bed with me? Yes or no? Because otherwise she could come later and say that she didn't want to and he should have been attentive to that and she thinks it was rape. And then the, the man, the perpetrator, would have a problem, a serious problem. So this has changed a lot of things. Many more rape cases has come forward. The police has to think in a new way. The lawyers and the judges have to think in a new way. So there has been a, a big need for teaching material. I have prepared, uh, made some teaching material for attorneys, for judges and police officers at all levels. So they have to read 20 pages on rape victims and what it means to be a rape victim and all the problems they can uh, endure and meet. So this is standard knowledge for a lot of people involved with police and, and court work uh, today in Denmark. And now comes something very interesting, I think, <coughs> because in each of the 14 police districts in Denmark, two psychologists are hired and are members of the staff, 
And what is their job? They should help and train police officers to interrogate victims in a sensitive, trauma-informed way. So 28 Danish psychologists are working as staff members in the police and help them to, be, to treat rape victims and <clears throat> victims of physical assault and other types of victims in a trauma-informed way. Think about what that cost and what the Danish police has done. I think it's great. But they needed it. They, they, they wanted to change their image. They wanted to, to become better. So, you know, it's, it's a good investment, I think, and very useful, very good. Now, you are prof people here, so I have some, a litmus test. I don't know what you know what that is from physics in the school, you have a little strip you put into different kind of uh, fluid, and then you see if they are acid or basic. You have a uh, an Estonian word for that? Lakmus in Danish, lakmus, yeah. <laughs> okay, now can a pros prostitute be raped? <laughs> How does the police meet a prostitute that come to the station and say, I was raped? A client of mine had, uh, gave a blow drop <coughs> to a truck driver and then she was severely beaten and kicked out of the truck and left on a desolate street. Would you <coughs> say this could be a rape case? I mean, she consented to have sex with him? Or would you call it a physical assault? Or this is, you know, where the professional has to think a little bit, what should we say here? I don't have the answer, but, but for the police it took some time to find out that, that she could be <coughs> called a rape victim. Another client of mine was a retarded 15-year girl that was being raped. The uh, pedagogues from the institution came with her to the rape center and told uh, later on that two days after we had this conversation, and I think it was two days after the rape, she was back at the bus station. And at the bus station, she had sex with some of the boys there that was hanging out there, and she got cigarettes, she got some candy, then went to the toilet, and she was raped there, and it didn't seem to impact her so much because she got attention from boys. She was 15 years old. She was not accustomed to used to get a lot of attention from boys. They thought she was nice and they had sex with her and she got a little gifts back. Would you call that rape or was that voluntary consensual sex and what would you do to help her? It's not easy, I can tell you but she got help. <clears throat> now, I've been talking about <clears throat> people who have a lot of problems, but sometimes we also have funny situations that attracts media interest, like <clears throat> the, the rape in the mayor's bed in Copenhagen. There are several mayors, major mayors, and uh, one of them was female, or several of them are female, and a year or two ago, there was this sensation about uh, that there's been rape in the mayor, female mayor's bed because three persons went to the same bed after a party and late in the night, the man had sex with a woman that was not the female mayor, but another woman. And then slowly it came out in the media day after day that there's been this situation and I think the female mayor stepped down and, and uh, the man was, uh, got a conviction of 16 months. So rape is not always in downstairs. You know the English series Upstairs and Downstairs? About the aristocrats and the servants downstairs. But <clears throat> as a member of this expert panel I mentioned before, I read 22 convictions of rape 
And what was most striking was that the amount of very heavy social and mental problems. Uh, so more than police work, I think these people needed social workers and treatment because the amount of social problems and psychological problems was, you know, very, very big. And there was also rape, but, you know, next to all the other problems, rape was not the, the biggest deal. So sometimes we think that <clears throat> because of uh, our uh, professions that rape is terrible and you should absolutely deal with it, but, you know, if you have eight big problems and also have a rape, then maybe you don't have <coughs> the, the resources to get justice for the rape and maybe it doesn't, does, doesn't matter so much because you have so many other severe problems like alcohol abuse, <coughs> uh, psychiatric problems and so on and so on. Now, <clears throat> we as professionals are not the judge, except the judges. Are there any judges here? No. <laughs> but all, all of the other staff, all, all we others, we are not <clears throat> judges. So, so we are what you might call a professional co-witness. We were not there, but we listened to the rape weeks and we get the story. And <clears throat> we are not just uniform but we're also humans who cares. I'm surprised today because I had the expectation from Denmark that there would be a lot of police officers in their uniforms, wearing a tie and blue uh, shirts and so on, but I don't see any uniform here. But when I teach Danish police officers, even at high rank, they wear uniforms, but not here. It was just my expectation, and that was, I learned something new. Well, <clears throat> you cannot bring justice in many cases because of a number of problems, but if you use a biblical expression, you can soften the wind to the newly cut lamps. I guess you know that in Estonian as well, this expression. You don't know it from, from the Bible? I don't know how it's said in Estonia, but soften the wind to the newly cut lamp. Make things a little bit easier. Be caring. <clears throat> and one example that I have used with the police in Aarhus for the rape center there was that uh, they might give <coughs> the victims uh, one or two calls because after the interrogation, a long time goes very often, nine months before uh, this case comes to court. And in many cases, it doesn't come to court because the police give up the case and say, we don't have any uh, proof. Uh, it will never uh, make it into court. Or <clears throat> the district attorneys at a later point say the same thing. The evidence is not strong enough. We have to give it up. That will just be another disappointment to her. It's word against word. I don't think we can make the case, so they give it up. But the one <coughs> who... Uh, and, and here's one, another very interesting thing that we found out through a, a PhD study, that a lot of victims, they withdraw their complaint to the police or when the police uh, call them or, and want them to ask them questions and so on, they don't respond. So, so they withdraw from the case. Maybe because it's unpleasant. Maybe because they want to protect the, the perpetrator because their relationship to him may have, may, maybe have changed. So many victims are not active. Maybe because they're more vulnerable. But of the cases who are, are brought to court, uh, more than half <coughs> ends with a conviction. And if you look at all the cases that come into the rape center, it's about 13% who end with a conviction. So it's not many. But one of the things, the psychological trauma-informed thing that a police officer can do 
is to make one or two calls during those nine months of average waiting time and say something like that. <clears throat> we haven't caught him yet, but we are still very attentive. I know it's hard for you to wait, but <clears throat> you should know we are grateful that you contacted us and, and we are still looking for him. This has like a healing effect on the trauma victims because they learn that <clears throat> police cares about them, have not found the perpetrator, he's not brought to, to uh, court, but that some official person come forward and say, I'm, I care about your situation, I don't have any good news, but I'm attentive of it. I'm, I'm aware of it, that it's hard for you, and you should know that we are still working on the case. We are still waiting for some traces to turn up. We are still attentive. Just a few sentences would make a big change for the victims. Easy to do, and it has a lot of impact. Now, <clears throat> some of you are engaged in uh, creating organizations or changing organizations. And if you want to have a rape center, what does it take to do a good one? <clears throat> well, the most important thing is that the top of the police, the chief police inspector, or whatever he's called, has to join the board of the rape center and engage in it. Because that sends a very strong signal to all his staff, this is important to me. So don't fuss around. I think it's important. Because if the top of the police does not engage, then it sends a signal to the system. This is not so important. I mean, my <coughs> some lower levels can, can do that. But it's important that it's ahead of us, the police. And now the police officers are teaching the staff at the center about how the police work in rape cases. And the other staff group, the nurses, the medical doctors, the psychologists, teach the police officers about their fields, about how they work with, with rape victims. So the two groups, or there are several groups, they, they learn from each other. They become better, more professional, because they know what are the other professions doing with a rape victim. I do this, the police do that, the nurses do that, the doctors do that. And one more thing that may be standard here, but uh, in this center in Aarhus, the police technicians, the forensic technicians, they develop a standard kit and procedures for how you should collect uh, evidence. Very simple, but, but very efficient. Uh, so it's used in all cases, and it has even been standardized. And even the cleaning of the room where the interrogation is, is certified by ISO 9000. Even the cleaning. Yes? I just wanted to clarify that we actually have this uh, sexual assault uh, crisis centers in yes. Estonia. Four of them in this part of the country. And in Estonia, we keep the material like evidence uh, for six months. Okay. Nice to know. So this is trivial to you. Okay, then I'll move on. <clears throat> so, but the centers in Estonia, are they, do they also have uh, police officers, representatives in the steering board of the centers? Do they have close contact with them? Very good. So this is trivial to, to you then, that there is close cooperation, reciprocal teaching, supervision, and a lot of things. Also fun in the group to create a, a, a strong uh, group uh, spirit. We made a handbook for professionals and so on. We also, I made a national website for rape victims. And this is the first 
Danish center situated in Aarhus. This is Jutland, and this is Odense, where I live now. Uh, <clears throat> and later, the other centers came forward. And the services offered are uh, <clears throat> for any victim from the age of 12. There is a maturity consideration because some girls age 12 or 13 can be quite mature, but in other cases they're sent to the child <coughs> uh, centers that I'll talk about in a little while. All services are free of charge. I hope it's the same here. The police can do the questioning in the center. It's a highly structured follow-up procedure. The nurses call the psychologists if needed, uh, call all the different groups and make arrangements uh, when the victim is in the, in the center. And <clears throat> we had a, a long discussion with the other centers because they are placed in the hospital at the gynecological department which I think is not so smart because gynecologists are another tribe than the nurses or the doctors in the emergency room because they see more people in, in severe crisis and I think they treat them in another way than a gynecologist will do. But, <clears throat> but one thing, good thing about the emergency ward is that everybody knows where it is and it's easily accessible at all times. And there are also overnight facilities if they need that, forensic examination, medical treatment, and counseling by a licensed psychologist. So, a lot of good things. And especially trained nurse, she's also. So, the underlying idea is that you gather specialists, you improve the victim's adjustment, you increase the understanding and consequences of rape, and maybe you can improve prevention initiatives, and <clears throat> the high level of collaboration across disciplines. And some colleagues and I wrote an article about that where you can read descriptions of this. And what have we achieved? The public awareness has increased. The number of convictions has gone up. We know that this group is very vulnerable and we don't announce it everywhere, but I announce it to you here because this is a, you are a professional society. And that means that <clears throat> ideally you should put more resources into uh, the later phases of treatment with these victims. More social work support, more therapy. And one problem I can tell you is that many of the most of the victims are very young, <clears throat> 20 or younger. And very often when they had one or two sessions with a psychologist, they feel, I'm getting so much better, I want to move on with my life, I have forgot what, what that body rape is. But then when we contact them three or six months later and interview them, we found out that a lot of them had PTSD, that they were in a bad shape. And <clears throat> at one time, we had 20% of them coming back to the psychologist to have more sessions. Because what we could see from our studies was that the therapy was not good enough. There were too many PTSD cases. And we haven't solved that problem, uh, and it is an international problem, that uh, many people leave therapy after rape very early and, and don't get well. And that means they live with these rape experiences and all the consequences for, for many years. And when you study old rape victims, you see an enormous amount of, of psychological, psychiatric problems and social problems. So they needed a much more intense treatment and, and social support to change their lives. And this cooperation has some ripple effects that we have established a center for assaulted children, the child centers that I'll tell you about later. There are advanced psychology classes for the police and there were even a research project on certain death with the forensic uh, doctors because, you know, some people, they die very sudden in, at middle age 
and then <clears throat> lately the the science medical science has found out that very often there are heart problems that they didn't know about and these are transmitted or you are genetic vulnerable if you are an offspring of those uh, people and then the forensic uh, so the forensic uh, doctors, they invited the family in and told them, well, your husband, your father has died, and by the way, the chances of you having the same fate early in life is 50%. And people fainted and went out of the door crying and because they, they were not prepared for these reactions, but you can imagine that if I told you that your chances of getting 50 years was reduced, you know, it'll have a, an enormous impact. So, so we help them with that situation. And the Netherlands has copied this model and started 16 centers like the one in, in Aarhus. So I think we have achieved a lot of things. Should we have a break here? Is that too early? Can we move on a little bit? Move on? You're not sleeping? I just had one question. Thank you. I missed one from this group over there, and a few more from you. Okay, we'll move on a little bit. I'll talk about the Danish child centers for abused children. We have five regional centers and two satellites because of uh, uh, long geographical distances. The centers are created after an Icelandic and a US model. Uh, this is the same gate principle, one door, the child comes in, or one door, all the <coughs> professionals come to the center. And this is for all children that has been abused, physical, sexual, or psychological, because psychological violence has become criminal, a criminal offense last year or a year and a half ago in Denmark. And the first person has been convicted already. Uh, if more than one sector is involved. So that means if it's just the social, uh, the, the social department in the municipality that deals with the case, then they don't have to go to the child houses. But the, if there's more than one sector, like the police or the hospital, then they have to go to the child centers by law. And what was the background? There was a lot of scandals 10 years ago uh, came forward where children has been abused for, for years and the authorities has done nothing despite that they received a lot of alerts from neighbors, teachers and others. And even today there are like 10 Danish towns and cities if I to another Dane mention their name the first thought is a child abuse scandal, where children were used for, parents uh, sold them for, for, for sexual uh, um, acts and mistreated them, very serious cases of neglect and punishment and so on, but the municipalities has done nothing. In one case, <coughs> one municipality they didn't give the family a house in another part of the country, but they paid it for half a year, they paid for the movement, they, they helped them in any way to get them out of their own municipality because if they had to be put into foster care, that would cost the municipality a lot. So it's much easier, much cheaper to send them to another part of the country. That municipality was fined more than <coughs> 1.2 million euros because of that some years later, because they were too smart. So <clears throat> there's been so many scandals. So they created the child package, they call it. And among that was that they wanted to have child centers and they offer by law video recordings of the child's testimony, a child-friendly interior. It's seldom that you put that into a law, that the environment should be child-friendly, but it stands in the law. A psychological assessment of the child, crisis support to the parents and child, cooperation with the social workers in the, in the municipality. 
So this is the, the law background for the child centers. And it has had some effect because there has been an increase in reports of concern uh, for a period of five, six years, it has doubled. There's been number of, the number of reports of concern where concern has been reported more than six times has also increased. This is not a good situation because the municipalities should act earlier. But, but people continue to, to send in reports of concern and eventually the municipality will do some action. And one more thing, the last point, the punishment for lack of reporting has been increased for leaders in social work and in the municipalities. So instead of having one month in jail, now they can have six months in jail if they don't react. It's incredible that you have to make law about that, but you need that because they need a whip. They have to report to themselves, to the municipality. Okay, yeah, that's the same here. Yeah, and then the head of the child services in the municipality has the decision. But in most municipalities today, this is like a manual for what to do. And most of them, they are very efficient because they, they would rather have one case too many than one case too little. And now what do the police do? Uh, the video interrogator, we call them in Danish, interview the child alone in a special room that is very child friendly. The interview is recorded so that the child only has to tell the story once and this is used in court. Now, <clears throat> the interview is followed by staff in another room and the defendant lawyer is also there and he's allowed to suggest questions that the police officer can ask the child. But the police, the, the video interrogator can refuse to ask the questions if he or she thinks that they're not appropriate or timely. So the defendant lawyer does not have the right to have certain questions to ask, but he can suggest it to the police officer who is in the room with the child that she or he could ask this or that question, but they have the right to refuse it because they don't think it's an appropriate question or it's not the right time because <clears throat> the child is very tired and they've been <clears throat> talking about things that is important and the officer says, I don't want to ask that question. And the recording is used in court. So, <clears throat> uh, make it easier for the child so they don't have to appear in court. And what is the interview structure? That is to create a pleasant atmosphere, take the time to make the child relax. This can sometimes be very difficult, but the <clears throat> interrogators, I think, are very good. And then make the child tell the story in its own word. They don't interrupt, they stimulate talking, they don't ask difficult questions that stop the flow. And do you know what? This is how I work as a psychologist with people in acute crisis that come with trauma. I ask them to tell their story. I don't interrupt, I stimulate their talking. Maybe I have a little question, maybe a few. But, but the thing is to, to, to make it a flow because all of us have stories, except in rare cases where you're not conscious or if you're a very small child that <clears throat> has difficulties in knowing what is reality and what is fantasy and so on. So the, the good thing is about letting it come forward. As a police officer, you might have, you want more information on specific objects, but if you stop the flow, then you uh, give away a lot of information. So you need to have the flow 
come forward, let the flow grow from the child. When the story has been told, then there is another phase where there are some curious, simple questions to elicit more information. Were there other children on the playground? Were there other adult men around? Was it an old man? Was, was he a young man? Very simple questions. And of course, there can be a number of them. And if there are confrontations, they have to be soft because you could make a confrontation with a child saying, in the beginning you said this and in the end you said that. What do you think is most correct and so on? You can ask such, such questions, but it has to be done in a soft way, not to threaten the child, not to tell the child, you are a liar. Because first you said that, and then you said that, and that can't be true. So, this is, it takes some skills to do it well. Seldom there is a second interview, uh, <coughs> because there are more questions that want to be, that you want to know more about. But uh, in the end, I write, all of this is age dependent. And what does that mean? Now, you're a group of professionals. What does age dependent mean? Now I'm the teacher. You are the students. Yeah. So you cannot ask the same questions to, that's the third. Now this role has done its job. Now I'm waiting for you. <laughs> uh, There's a clash between law and between psychology. Because you want to know the truth. The law people want to know the truth, and therefore they start asking, do you know what the truth is? Do you know that could this be truth or could that be a lie? And if, do, if you cannot answer, then you're, you're not worth nothing like a witness. Or That's the major message of this law perspective. I think from a psychological perspective, I would take that at the end and not in the beginning. Because I want to, to get the story from the child. And of course here I'm thinking more about younger children. Because age dependent means that if you have a child that is, has reached puberty or is older, then you can treat him or her almost like an adult. But you still have to be aware that they are more vulnerable, they are maybe shy in front of a, an authority and a, an adult person, competent person. So you have to be gentle and you want to, to get the story forward. And there are some unpleasant things in the story. The, the abuse itself, but also feelings of betrayal and feelings of maybe I'll never see my father again and things like that. So therefore, you shouldn't stop the flow. And I think saying things like that in the very beginning will stop the flow in some children. And you'll never get the story. I agree with you, but our Supreme Court was unfortunate with that. But we did get a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights which uh, um, really raised the question whether it's, or actually, let's uh, put it that way, that they say it's not
Yeah. But the, the funny thing is, or the strange thing is, that <coughs> you could want to protect a parent, but if this parent has abused you for a long time, should he or she still be protected? Doesn't the child have a voice of its own, its own rights? Should that be under the, the, the rights of the parents? We'll leave it here, because it's a long discussion. Uh, yeah. Um, I think we should have a break soon. Or can you go on forever? It's a three o'clock. Three o'clock, yes. And what is it now? Ten to three? Okay. Okay. I hope you're still awake. Yes. Also at the, the bottom row. Yeah, you are. But also over there. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, 2,000 children come to the child houses every year. We are 6 million here. How many are in Estonia? Three and a half? One point three? Small country? Okay. Okay, so you should have less children come forward. I think the police are involved in half of the cases. Most are because of physical abuse. I haven't controlled those numbers, but that's why I have a question mark there. One quarter is about sexual abuse, and very few because of psychological abuse. That's just the law came a year and a half ago, I think, and the first cases have come forward. I have a good news here for you police people. Police loves this way of working because it's so meaningful and respectful to the children. So... It takes something from the video interrogator, some training, but uh, I think they, they all think it's the, the best job they can have. <clears throat> um, of course, you also have to make interrogations with the perpetrators and the family members and sometimes pedagogues, teachers and neighbors. And sometimes they split so the video interrogator just talks with a child and then other police officers make the other interrogations. Now, I come to something very interesting now. I told Fina about it at the lunch she has left. Okay, so it's new to everyone here. Uh, <clears throat> when you see the, the statistics from the child center, the forensics are just involved in 2% of the cases. But a recent study of 200 children consecutively, that means 200 children in a row, they were studied by the forensics in Copenhagen, and that revealed that 7% of the children, there were injuries and signs that could affect police charges. But because they were only involved in 2% of the cases, they missed another 5% because it was not obligatory to examine the children. <clears throat> but in addition to that, they found that in 30% of the cases, there were undetected illnesses that needed care. No one had expected that. Children had eczema, some had problems with hearing or, or their eyesight, or other kind of, of uh, <clears throat> illnesses that normal parents would have uh, seen and would have had them treated. But almost one third of the children, there were undetected illnesses. So they were victims of neglect also, because their parents have not discovered the illnesses. Of course, all parents can... <clears throat> be unattentive to some symptoms for a while, but when they were examined by this uh, forensic nurse, they found 30%. And now as a new project, together with forensics in Copenhagen, we are going to examine 160 children in the women's shelters, because we expect to find the same thing. That there are a lot of injuries inside, not a lot, but perhaps 5-10% of children who has been beaten, and that could be meaningful to 
have charges against the, the, the father or the person in, uh, from the home. But we also do, will do some trauma screening to see uh, how much treatment they need to see how uh, severe the psychological problems are. And for that purpose, now I jump from the world of police officers to the world of psychological assessment because we have different tools that we have developed. The first one is a diagnostic parent interview. The second one is a dollhouse stem story play where you have representations of the parents and their self, a projective test, projective test. And for the larger children, we have a cartoon test, which is semi-projective, where we see if they have PTSD or complex PTSD. And for the larger children, we use questionnaires or interviews, where we <coughs> study PTSD, anxiety, depression, self-love, peer relations, with Beck Youth Inventory. And the psychologists for the young children also use drawings, play, talk, and observations. And when they're done that, they have three or four sessions for that, then they make an assessment report and send it to the municipalities. And here you can see the tools. This is the diagnostic uh, assessment tool. This is the cartoon test. And this is the child trauma screen. And for the older ones, we look at Jean Piaget, the Swiss uh, psychologist who described different levels of operations, cognitive operations. And when you, leave, when you reach the level of formal cognitive operations, then you have the same level of abstractions like adults have. <coughs> of course, you don't have all the experiences and all the, the words that adults have, but you have, in principle, you have reached the, this highest level. Uh, and here you see the cartoon test. There's one uh, cartoon for, for each symptom of PTSD and we have made them uh, in a way so uh, we have to know beforehand what has the child experienced. Has this been sexual assault? Has this been psychological assault? Has this been physical assault? Has there been we also have tests for death in the family and for illness in the family and for war and also for fire, by the way. <clears throat> you had a fire here in Estonia some years ago in a child house where uh, a lot of children died in a fire. There was a woman who contacted me to get this test. It took me a long time to send it to her. I'm sorry for that. But... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the idea with this test is that you read something aloud about this guy, Thomas. Thomas is thinking of what happens at home. He gets pictures of it in his head and it feels like it's happening again. How often do we have it like Thomas? And then at the top there are three thermometers. One is empty, one is half full and one is full. And then the child has a pencil and puts a circle around the thermometer that best express how the child has it with this symptom. And then the next one is about nightmare. And <clears throat> so the idea is that they read a little story about another child called Thomas, and then each time you ask, how often do we have it like Thomas? So you check out the symptoms. And this is the... the Odense Child Trauma Screen. We couldn't find a more sexy word, so we took that. Uh, and here's uh, my colleague, Sile, uh, some 10 years ago. And here you have this Lego dollhouse. And then the idea is that you have a very structured situation. It's manualized, so the psychologists say the same things. Introduces the, the dolls, Lego French dolls. Introduces the house. Uh, and tell the child that there will be some stories and the psychologist will start to tell the stories. Uh, the child names, the, give the dolls names uh, and then the first one, the first one is about a birthday party. It's very simple. It's just warming up. 
And the next one is about a nightmare, that the child is lying in his bed and has a nightmare. And then he wakes up in the night. I had a dream, I had a dream, I have a terrible dream. And then you put some anxiety, some arousal into the child, and then you ask the child, would you please continue the story? So this is sort of the way the, the STEM stories are built up, that there is some drama in them for a child. It's dramatic. And um, then the children are a little bit aroused. And then you see, how do they handle this arousal? And we had just finished a, a study of almost 200 normal children, and their stories are just so boring, you know. Each time I go into my father's and mother's bedroom and said I had a nightmare, or oh, they come running. And they said, oh, little, my little friend, why don't you come into our bed and lie there between mother and father? And, and then I feel good. So this is the, the, the standard story of average children. But when you see the traumatized children, they have other stories. They, they, <clears throat> uh, they don't get help from their parents. They do a lot of things on their own. Uh, sometimes they'll go to the kitchen and have some water, and then they'll go back in bed, and some of them will cry there, or stay awake for some time, open the television, and look at the television. They don't go to their parents for help, because they don't expect them to help. And sometimes they are punished, and sometimes their stories are, are very strange. So it's a very good way of identifying children who has uh, <coughs> representations of themselves and others uh, that, that are problematic. Because the children use their own experiences, that they refer to them, that's how the world is, and uh, you can sort of open into their world through this kind of, of, of tool. And the, the way it works, the, the, the reason it works is that it's manualized. It's the same thing that is said to every children, and even the modulation of the voice is trained by the psychologist. So they induce the same kind of arousal in each story at the same time. And, and you know, the rules for which dolls are used and how they are named. And in this story, we don't use that doll, they put it away. And, and then the great thing about it is that some of these children are not very good verbally, but they can show uh, things with their hands. So they move the, the figures around, and then the psychologist can say, what happened here, why, why is he there? Small questions that can supplement their story. And if they speak very lowly, the psychologist will repeat in a higher voice what was just said. And the whole session is recorded, and afterwards it's scored, and we give them a score for their <coughs> uh, performance. So it's very useful. It's used very much in the child centers, and, and they are very happy with this test. And now come another sad story, <coughs> because we studied what do the municipalities do, do with the assessment from the psychologists, from the child houses, and they ignore them. We got the, all the documents from the municipalities in 116 cases in the region south, and we had the assessment from the child houses, and in most cases they uh, recommended individual treatment. But what do the uh, municipalities do? In many cases, they put the children in, in custody, in, in family care, or out of home care. But when they come to foster care, they don't get any treatment. They said that being in the family is all the treatment they need. They need some normal substitute parents and that everything is good. But it's not good because they don't get the treatment or they put them into what we call family houses where the therapeutic skills are very few. So that means that the family gets some kind of psychoeducation and training in how to 
relate to each other and how to speak to each other in a way that is not offensive and is nice and so on. But the children's needs for being understood and, and getting some processing of the trauma, they don't get that. Only in 17% of the cases. So the child centers do a lot of good work, give it to the municipalities who said, well, we don't have to follow that. That's a sad story. But worst of all, that in none of the 116 reports from the municipalities of the documents could we see someone who requested that the child should be assessed once more after, for instance, three or six months or one year to see if the trauma intervention, the foster care or the family house, if this intervention had worked and had reduced the problems in the children. Not in one case did the municipality write that, ask for that, expect that. They just leave it alone. So that means some children, they come to the child center several times because they're not helped efficiently. And then after one year, two years, they come back because they've been maltreated once more. So even if you have good systems, they're not perfect. The next link is not working. So now in the region south, the child centers there have <coughs> built up a model for trauma-focused uh, intervention, CBT, and it works very well. So now they will ask the municipalities, will you buy this service from us? It will cost you 3,000 euros, but then we guarantee a good treatment. So we are very excited to see if the municipalities will buy this package or I think maybe it's too expensive and they won't help the child in an efficient way. Yeah. Um, this is maybe a little repetition, but uh, I think we can take it. Uh, <coughs> This is about the investigative interview uh, that you could use with small children. I talked about that before. But these are sort of the general principles. And it's very like to the way psychologists work with acute trauma victims. Could you tell me what happened? And this flow, this story can be supported via your curiosity. If you're genuine curious, then small questions will not stop the process, but it will stimulate it. Can you see the difference between curious questions and questions that are, uh, that are <coughs> uh, not in line with, with the story that the, the client, the victim, tells you? But if the, if the questions are in line with the story, then they are not a distraction. Then the victim will just give you the supplement information. But if your questions, is, your questions are very odd, then it will stop the process of telling. So this is very important that you have curious questions, natural, and not talk here about the right doses. And don't question the story. You can question it later on, in the following session or later on, and stay with the feelings as a police officer or a social officer. From time to time, you might say something, not from time to time, but a few times you can say something like, it must have been very hard, or it must have hurted you a lot, or be very painful. <clears throat> so you build up trust, you're kind, you're caring, and you may think now that I suggest this to be human to the victim. No, I do that because you get the best information from the victim, if you work like that. Because you get much, more, much fuller information, much more details, because you, you listen, and maybe you want to ask a few questions about something special, but you can wait. You could ask them at the end of the interview or in the next interview. So. 
you want to have a full story. So the next time or after a break, you can go back to the story and repeat it in your own words. That tells the victim that you have heard what she said and you can remember it. And of course you don't say everything just like she said, but you condense it a little bit and then you can ask details. Could you ascribe the whale, the wall, the floor, his speech, his smell, and so on. So then you come with extra questions that can make uh, your work uh, better. <clears throat> and then after another break or in a following session, you summarize their perspective and you can ask for possibly perspective of others. What would a witness see when, if she watched it from uh, some point, from some distance? Would her understanding be the same as your perspective as a victim? And what do you think the often offender, what would he see, what would his perspective be? And how did the interaction develop? Because, you know, with every assault, every rape, every uh, violent situation, there is an interaction. It's very seldom that you stand still, someone just passes you and bangs you out and you're dead or fainted. It's usually an, interven usually an interaction. There's some conversation, there's some glances, there's some reaction in the faces, there's some words that go forward. <clears throat> and then, of course, the last part is about the criminal pro process, <clears throat> about catching the offender, making a case, decision of should he go to court, and so on. And in court you need <coughs> a story perhaps from the other side, and who can support you in that situation. We'll soon have the break, but just I'll tell you something exciting. This is how you can uh, succeed with helping domestic violence victims and help the children. And I call it the East Jutland police model. You saw Jutland before, you know it's part of Denmark, East Jutland, that's where I come from. Uh, and what is the Estonian term for uh, <clears throat> what we in Danish call domestic, we call, we call it husbetakler, means house noises, domestic quarrel. That's your Estonian term. And that's a euphemism, because what is domestic quarrel? This euphemism, this term can hide the problem. So in many cases, when police come to a domestic violence situation, they just <clears throat> uh, find out if anyone is dead or severely injured, then they call an ambulance, and then they take the, the perpetrator with them. But in many cases, the, the partners, the, the spouses, they have, they fall down and say it's not so bad and he didn't mean it and so on. So, <clears throat> and then the police drive away and are happy there's no more work to do there. So, maybe you should think about your term, should you call it interpersonal violence, should you call it intimate partner violence, should you call it family violence, if there are children there. And by the way, in Denmark, the police has an obligation to act if there's been a criminal offence. I hope it's the same here in Estonia, but I'm not sure. It is the same? Yeah. The police don't always follow that. But in some <clears throat> police districts, they've been very keen on it, a police district near to Copenhagen, has been famous for that, that they always took away the, the perpetrator uh, <coughs> for, for ages and helped the woman. But now, this East Jutland police model, they have found something very good. When they <coughs> receive a, a call on domestic calls, they do their ordinary police work, they investigate the problem, they see the damages, they study the safety situation and so on. And then they give the husband and the woman 
a card each saying that you can get help. You can call this number and you can get help. You can get help together if you can find out of that. Or you can get help, each of you. Your husband can get help in one place, and the woman can get help in another place. That's very nice. Instead of just doing the police business, you know, take four the, the cards here, here, you can get help, free of charge. If you want to, you can do it together, or you can do it individually. But a lot of people called. Not everyone, but many. But the best thing is that the next day, the social worker came from the municipality to see uh, the situation, to see the situation of the children. And that means that the number of reports doubled from uh, in that municipality because there were so many problems. And <clears throat> you know, even if you have a fight as a, a couple, if the question about that the children should stay with you comes forward, then many get more seriously involved in solving the problems because they don't want to lose their children. And that's the risk. Because the municipality knows that this is a home we're fighting. So the number of notifications of concern doubled in the three-year period. And many more children got help. And some parents changed their behavior. That was just what I said. Because they could get help, but they also realized that they could lose the contact with their children. And that's a very strong motivator for change. But did anyone suggested that this project should be continued? No. After three years, after a very positive report, it just stopped. And no one did anything further. But something that costed, I don't know, <coughs> 400,000 euros, less than that, 300,000 euros, lasted for three years, helped hundreds of couples, couples and their children. In my eyes, a big success and then it was dropped. And the problem continues in all police districts all over the country. No one has an efficient way of solving the problem, but this was an efficient way. And then it stopped. You know, should you laugh or should you cry? I think it's sad, and I think that sometimes we talk about reinventing the wheel. Here we have a wheel that works, and then it stopped and put into the garage. And then five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, someone would reinvent the wheel and, st and start a similar project somewhere in the world. Maybe in Estonia, maybe in Denmark. I don't know. We'll see the new government. <coughs> we still have a little time. Yes, I'll take a little point more. Fun? Five minutes. Okay. I made a study of victims in, of physical assault in the emergency room. And we studied around 5,000 from uh, three to four, one to five years before the assault. And here we have a number of risk factors. If you're male, divorced, non-ethnic Dane, unemployed, limited education, has been <clears throat> provided help from the municipality when you were a child, had a conviction, a diagnosis for alcohol or drug abuse. And these were very strong predictors. And then we uh, used a method called propensity matching where we compared victims with no, non-victims who had the same profile. And then we followed them afterwards because 15 years later, we found that this group, victims of physical assault in the emergency room, they had a lot <coughs> uh, more psychiatric diagnosis, psychosis, anxiety, depression. There are many more suicides at him. Diagnosis of drug and alcohol abuse and digestion problems and musculoskeletal problems. And <coughs> even when we control for PTSD and our stress diagnosis. And this is an example to me where I could use the gate principles. 
Because when you come to the emergency room and you're injured, I've tried it myself, then you are in, in a bad mood, you're in a low mood because you've been beaten up, you're injured, you're bleeding, something is broken. And <clears throat> imagine that there was some kind of intervention here that after you have been cleaned and, and uh, got the medical attention, then there would be some social worker coming to you and say, uh, what do you need in your life to, to improve your life quality? Could you need a, a better apartment or living situation? Could, could we help you with finishing your education? Could we help you with try finding a job for you? Could we help you if you have very lonesome or put you into some social network, give you a mentor, things like that? I think that could change the life situation for, for a lot of people. Most of them are very young. So this is the part of my thinking is if we have a gate where a lot of people, a lot of victims come in, could you then create an institution at that part that could help some of them or many of them into a better life situation. I think that would be very nice. And this is one place where you could make an effort. Uh, psychologists who were in uh, police departments, yes. uh, yeah. uh, is this also a project or is this... Uh, That's permanent. Permanent. Okay. Yes. And what are their obstacles in their work? Uh, I think you're going to talk about it also, about the police culture and the whether they... Uh, in which way is it uh, hard? Uh, I think the situation is very, very good because the, the chief police, the national police, has this as an, not just the obligation, but as some, a priority because the, the, the uh, measures on, on satisfaction were so low and because there's been this uh, momentum in society that Rape victims should be treated better. There's been a new law, and <clears throat> the police has to stand up. So because the psychologists are staff members, that makes a big difference because they're inside the force. They <clears throat> know something about victims, uh, about trauma victims, and, and they help the officers. No one is perfect, nor are all police officers perfect, but they can be become better. That's the idea. So therefore, the resistance is not very big. I know two or three of them who is working there, my former students, and they love this work. And I think they think it's very similar that the police officers not just accept them, but <coughs> is, is happy, is grateful, are grateful uh, because they get help to do something that is difficult. As I wrote before, you're not just uniform, you're also human with, with feelings and if you can do a better job, I'll come back to it in a little while about the negative things that happen in the police, can happen in the police, but, but the acceptance is good. So that's a totally new situation. And that's why I before <coughs> with a rape center said, talked about the importance of the chief police engaged in, in in the centers, because that sends a, a, a signal down the ranks to everyone that this is important for me as a chief. So if you get those signals, then, you know. I think in, uh, in Estonia, uh, in police and probably in some other uh, law enforcement authorities, uh, uh, also many uh, people who do good work in the being uh, trauma informed and providing psychosocial uh, support, but uh, what I hear uh, quite a lot is, uh, uh, I think they, in many cases they term it as uh, doing the social work, uh, so that the police officer is now a social worker uh, who needs to do this listening and, uh, and helping, uh, but, uh, uh, and, uh, and the negative aspect in this is that uh, uh, they think that it's not their job. Yeah. Uh, 
someone else could do with that. In the next slides, I'll come back to that. But I think this is very important that you have a dis definition of your job. <clears throat> I can give you another example from education. Uh, <clears throat> when bright students leave teacher colleges, many of them want to be very good professionals. And some <clears throat> get a job in areas where the, the parents are well educated and they love their professional position and, and uh, they have uh, challenges that, that they can meet. But other teachers, they come to slum areas where the professional standards are not very high and many of them engage in social work. They, they, they find another purpose and say, my students here are, are not, <coughs> their parents are not very well off, they have a lot of problems with elementary skills. I will teach them those skills, but I'll also try to, to give them more social capital. Tell them about how you can move on in society, where you can find ways to, to lift your standards. And I will also teach them to brush their teeth and don't wear <coughs> rubber boots all winter because it's not good for your feet and things like that. So they engage in, in that kind of immediate social work to, to help them, to lift them. So they could get another perspective study research shows. Okay, thanks for the question. Now you are just one or two questions behind the other group here. Uh, I've been involved in all Danish disaster studies in, since the uh, Scandinavian star fire. Um, and uh, recently we had a, a shooting incident in a shopping mall in Copenhagen where three people were killed. I just uh, sent out, uh, with the help of the police, uh, questionnaires to all the witnesses and victims who were in the shopping mall. Um, because after the storm there are victims, and what should the police do with those victims? That's uh, continuing your question there in the first row. Uh, <coughs> because in Denmark we have five regions, and in each region there is a corpse of staff from the psychiatric wards that are activated and they meet the victims and they talk with them individually on small groups, like a family group or if someone uh, were working together, they can talk with them together. And this session, you know, <clears throat> the, the call is there, uh, it goes out in the psychiatric hospital. If people are home, they, they're ranked through their manuals for how to activate them. They're sent to this particular place, a sports hall or something else, where the victims come in and then they, they have conversations and it's not no, normally very good organized, but, but uh, each of the victims will have a conversation with someone from the psychiatric ward. The problem in my eyes is that many of them don't know very much about crisis. They know a lot about psychiatric diagnosis and patients, but they don't have <coughs> Uh, much knowledge about acute uh, reactions. I don't think they do much harm, but I think there should be a better alternative. But it costs money, and the police and the politicians are not willing to pay for that. But there is another huge problem, and that is after the, this first session, there's no further help. In principle, the municipalities should take over and give the disaster victims help. They don't do it, so they're just left on their own. Another sad story. But <clears throat> sometimes the police offers a technical debriefing where they go through the incident with the victims. What happened? What did we do? What do we know? And this has turned out to be very helpful by victims. For instance, after the Great Belt Bridge accident uh, a year ago, almost two years ago, where um, uh, a truck on a freight train uh, loosened and hit a passenger train, and eight people were killed on the bridge. Uh, <clears throat> then afterwards, uh, two months afterwards, I think, the police invited all the, the passengers from the train to a technical debriefing where they told them everything they knew about the, 
the <coughs> truck that loosened about the trains that have interrogating the, the staff on the train and they knew about the, the setup for psychological talk and, and, uh, and they had of course interrogated a lot of witnesses and people on, on board the train. So they presented to the audience, to the victims, what had happened. <coughs> Uh, and what did we do, and why was the problems with getting ambulances, and why were the problems with getting into the train, that was because of the currency from the electrical uh, wires that had fallen down and so on. So they could uh, tell the audience, uh, a lot, give them a lot of information about what happened at the accident. And this is very helpful to victims. I've been present in another situation in in my former university in Aarhus, where a student killed two other students with a, a, a rifle and then uh, hurted two more, injured two more, and then committed suicide. About a month later, the police made uh, the same kind of debriefing for the victims. Showed them, what do we know about what happened? Uh, what have we done? Uh, what was our activities, uh, and <clears throat> there were problems, and they told uh, the audience about the problems they had. So they were very honest, and <clears throat> give them sort of a full information about what they knew, and that has been very much appreciated by the victims, because if you are a victim, you know, you see the world from this perspective, and then someone who is in the other end of the room sees the world from that perspective, and sees something out of the window that I can't see, or hear something from behind that door that no one else hears. So, being together, sharing information from the police to the audience, means it had the effect that someone in the audience raised their hand and said, well, <coughs> I experienced this, or I was very unhappy and, and anxious because I had to wait a long time to be rescued from the train and blah, blah, blah. So, so the police and, and the whole audience, all the victims, would get, will get the same information and get extra information because someone in the audience has experienced something new that they tell the police and the others in the audience. So I don't know if, if uh, Kaya Tola talked about that, but many victims, you can... Uh, compare their, their cognition, their perception of the situation as a puzzle. And if some pieces in the puzzle are missing, you spend a lot of time on finding the last pieces to put into the puzzle. And that's psychological, very interesting, and that's part of what you do in, in, in therapy with trauma weeks, and you try to, to give them more pieces so the puzzle is complete and you can make some kind of a closure that you can end all your ruminations, all your thoughts, endless thoughts and <clears throat> speculations and, and get done with the, the accident or the, the disaster. In that respect that you can put it aside, I had a client who compared it with having made a, an a, a small book with photographs and, and when we finished the therapy he said it was like he could put the book on the shelf and he didn't have to think about it all the time but he could also take the book down and look at the pictures and think about what happened but he could close the book and put it back. I think that was a very nice metaphor, a very nice picture for having ended a, a process of uh, working through the, the accident or the trauma. So, I don't know what you have in Estonia. I hope you don't have too many disasters or terror attacks or things like that. But uh, when it happens, it's very good to have a plan, to be prepared for that. And uh, you can copy the plans of other countries or you can develop your own. And, but uh, I think it's very nice to have, uh, be prepared in beforehand and, and have some kind of plan for what to do, who shall do what, and where do we get the people to do this and that, and can we train some of the people to prepare to a disaster situation. 
And what is missing in Denmark, I'll be honest with you, is there's no follow-up. So they have this first conversation, and if they're lucky, and some of them are, the police will give them a, a technical debriefing, and they will be happy about that. But I have studied the long-term consequences, and for about 15, 20%, they are chronic uh, problems. But someone out there in London, Chris Bruin, which Kaya mentioned in her last slide, uh, he's done some very good work because there was something we call the London bombings in 2005 in two underground situations where some IRA, IRA people, I think, uh, activated some bombs. And uh, <clears throat> Bruin did something very good because he, after some time where he get, got the permissions from the police, and it takes some months, you know, then he uh, got in contact with 900 witnesses, victims and relatives from the bombings. And all 19, 900 got a letter with condolences, advice, a self-screener for PTSD, and where, there was some, where they, they could read something about how to get help. And when you ask people afterwards, everyone was happy with that letter because they had the feeling they were not forgotten. It was very good. And they got some advice. And 600 uh, reacted actively for a proper trauma screen. They called back or mailed back to the institution and said, we, I would like to, to, to <coughs> uh, answer some questions and had a small interview to see if I need uh, treatment. That's two thirds that uh, asked for that. And one third accepted therapy and had a number of sessions individually with uh, a therapist. To me, this is a model, a perfect model. They have similar, not similar, but they have other models in Norway after the Udøya uh, bomb and shooting. Uh, <clears throat> but this is more complicated because all the young people come from all over Norway, which is a very uh, large country in extension. So it's more difficult to, to create some kind of effective help for them. But in a small country with short distances, I think that this could be a perfect model. I would like to have something like that in Denmark. Now we come to another group where the policemen are social workers, psychiatric patients. <clears throat> uh, when I have meetings with the local police chiefs, they talk about these problems again and again, that many of their, much of their police work has to do with psychiatric patients. They're dangerous, they create dangerous situations, they scare people. And sometimes the police are scared also and don't know exactly what to do. So in four police districts, there's been a project where the <coughs> uh, police had one patrol car with a psychiatrist or a psychiat psychiatry nurse on duty, which were in the car or were immediately available and could enter the homes together with the police when the police was alerted, so they could, if they were alerted, that there could be a psychiatric patient involved. In many cases, the police knows that before they go. Sometimes they don't. They come out and find out. Then they could call the nurse or the psychiatrist, and they would come within a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. <clears throat> so this is a huge help for the police, that they have psychiatric expertise on call, they can just activate it and then they're there. Odense, the city I come from, is the only police district that has continued this project because they found it so valuable. So by their own money, they pay for these uh, psychiatric services uh, <clears throat> because they think it helps them very much. It, they avoid many situations that could be dangerous because the psychiatric staff know to talk with patients. They start 
conversations with them about <clears throat> their medical problems, their symptoms, recent contact with the system. They sort of uh, close, they reduce the arousal in the situation because they know about their problems. They're usually problems, and then they start talking about that. So that means the situation becomes much more manageable because they're professional people from a psychiatric point of view. So the police does not have to act as social workers because the, the, the professional staff is right behind them and know what to do. They can solve everything, but they can solve a lot of things. And they teach the police officers on how do we calm those people down, what do they need, is uh, are they out of medicine, we'll get some more, some fresh supplies, are the symptoms that are very serious, have they broken the contact with the system, they can reactivate it and open doors for the patient. So <clears throat> I think this is a very relevant work, so the police officers should not be alone, mister, on the, on the duty with a psychiatric patient, but, but they are supported by someone who's very competent. That could be part of a solution. I don't know if you have that. Yeah. But that's the model to investigate. You could ask the, the police in Odense about their experiences and the cost and so on. Now to sum up some of the things you meet <coughs> trauma victims every day, right? Almost every day. And sometimes you can help a lot by asking simple questions like, how is this, how is it to be you? Look at them, interesting, being interested. Have you earlier in your life experienced severe events? If someone asked me that question, I would start, you know, talk, talk, talk. Uh, so that are, this, this is invitations that open up a lot of people. You can try it when you go home in the tram or when you need your, meet your neighbor or someone new at work. How is it to be you? Then be ready to spend 10 minutes listening. Or <clears throat> have you earlier in your life experienced severe events? You know, ask, you have 20 minutes to listen to that. And don't take over. I'll give you a personal experience. <laughs> because after this assault 40 years ago, I had my arm in a cast. And I had some injuries. And uh, <clears throat> after a few days, I came back to work. And everyone was asking, what happened to you? What happened to you? And I started telling, well, I was at this railway station late at night. And then two young fellows came, you know. And then something strange happened. <clears throat> I've been telling my story for about one minute, perhaps two minutes. And then the other person interrupted me because they wanted to tell their story when they were assaulted many years ago, or the last time they were in hospital, or the last time they had contact with the police. That was not a good experience. Or something else, the rise of youth criminality in our society, you know. And I sat, stood there, you know, injured and vulnerable and, and hurt. And they talked, they, they talked a lot about their things. They didn't have eyes for me. They didn't attend to me. That was very strange. I was a trained psychologist. Many of my friends, colleagues were psychologists. My wife was a social worker. All her friends were social workers. The same thing happened again and again hundred times in the first month. No one had, but two, had the, the time, the patience to listen to me and say something like, that must have been very terrible to you. Just a simple sentence like that. Two people did that, my sister and the librarian at my work. And 98, they just talked about their own things. They were not properly trained in trauma work because something <clears throat> in, the, in the, the story about being assaulted activated 
fear or tension or excitement in other people, and, and that means that, that they suddenly want to talk, that they stand in front of a recent trauma victim, and they don't have the, the surplus to, to listen and stay in contact because their own story is more important. That was very, I learned, that from, I learned a lot from that. And you can think about it also. So <clears throat> if you meet a, a trauma victim and you invite, you shouldn't start telling all your own stories. You should leave them for your husband or wife or friends <laughs> or therapist. Uh, and you can come with remarks like this. You had a rough life or a rough time. You must feel hurt. It must have been difficult. You had a big loss. Things like that. That reflects what you have just heard the other people saying. And this is enough. Because I had the feeling after the remarks from my sister and from the librarian, the biblical expression of balsam on your soul. You know that word? I had that feeling. That I felt good because they were compassionate, they were sympathetic, and I feel a little bit healed. <clears throat> so, so saying simple things, like one of these sentences, would give a, a lot of, will have a lot of impact on victims. The victim feels that you have seen him or her, feels recognized, you show sympathy and empathy. Don't take over. Don't move forward with your own story. Leave that for another occasion. <clears throat> and now comes some things from about the colleagues. Because when you start to work trauma-informed, maybe you have to fight cynicism, cynicism among your colleagues. And again, the chief sets the example, the role model. Can the chief be a good model talking in a compassionate way about the clients, the criminals, the witnesses, uh, in uh, having uh, an, uh, an understanding of their victim situation. This is very important because this uh, gives a very strong signal to the staff that this is the way we behave now, this is the way we think, this is the way we should deal with victims. It's not that cynicism <coughs> doesn't have a place in, in some jobs if you are very frustrated, if you are very exhausted. If you go all day as a police officer and collect human remains after an airplane ticket, airplane accident, for instance, then I think cynicism is warranted. But these are among colleagues who have a job <coughs> not open to the public. This is a way of surviving uh, a very difficult situation where you <coughs> pick up heads and skulls and legs and, and you give them nicknames because, you know, it's very frustrating and instead of crying, you make a little bit of fun in a tough way among men or among uniformed staff. And I think this is a situation where you can accept cynicism, but, but not as a primary response when you are together with victims. This is bad police work. And we have been starting a process of looking at burnout and secondary traumatization uh, in the police forces because many police officers meet a lot of trauma situations where you can do little when children die in traffic, or die in a fire, or drown, or you come to domestic violence situation, or you as an officer are watching police, are watching child pornography for hours because you are uh, hunting some criminals there. You uh, make interrogation about child abuse and so on. This is distressing, this is hard work, this is difficult. And you need assistance, you need supervision, you need uh, help to, to process that and to uh, 
learn to leave it behind you so it doesn't fill your own, fill your own life when you are at home and when you're off work. So, <clears throat> um, we have been studying, we are studying right now uh, the Danish police force, uh, all of it, about half of them are participating. And <clears throat> we have, from the international literature, we know that about 14% of police officers develop PTSD at some point in their professional life. In the general population, the, the prevalence is about 5%. And when you uh, <clears throat> investigate the number of violent incidents, police officers in average has about five violent incidents every six months. In the general population, this happens to 80% one or two or four times, three or four times in their whole lives. So there's a difference between five times every six months and three or four times for a whole life. So this ongoing study, we found that last year the number of PTSD cases that uh, was 1.1%, and 7% has a number of PTSD symptoms. And if you have many critical incidents, there are more cases of PTSD. And one other interesting thing is that if there were many incidents early in your career, then there were more PTSD. So people, police officers, also need help early in their careers to process some of the violent things that they meet in the job. And we were able to make a comparison because uh, 30 years ago there was a, a, a study of the working environment of the police where 97% of the Danish police force participated. Good old days. And uh, uh, then we could make a comparison. And we asked, we had a question where we asked, are there incidents that continue to have an impact on you? And <clears throat> 30 years ago it was one quarter, and now it's almost half that says that there are specific incidents or more incidents that impact your life now. And we asked them what kind of <clears throat> situations there were, and one quarter were about dangerous situations with threats, one quarter were accidents where they came out as police officers in traffic accidents and in others, and one third was about death and anxiety provoking criminality where weapons are used or other kind of dangerous situations. Very few uh, had a negative work environment, 6%. And then there were other, a lot of other different things. And children were involved in one quarter, but that was in, in uh, the other categories. So maybe there are more incidents, I think there are more incidents today than a generation ago that impacts police officers. And if you look at a study from the States, then 90% of the US officers, they experience stigmatization, negative attitudes, devaluation, discrimination, fear of being sacked and that stops them from help-seeking behavior. So stigmatization is not just about the, the witnesses or the, <coughs> the criminals, it's also about patients, and it's also about you as a police force. There can be taboos about, you should have the John Wayne syndrome, you could uh, do everything and you never get down, you're never hurt, but in real life, Many are afraid of showing if they are hurt. So, but things have improved over the last 10 years in Denmark. And uh, I think we are moving in a good direction. We can talk more about it. This study talks about it. The police, in the high rank is aware of it. And, and I think that this awareness spreads out over the whole force and also makes them better police 
officers. What are the uh, self-care uh, routines uh, of our police in, uh, in Denmark? There are system or <coughs> a body system where someone else in the station is responsible for, for watching out his fellows, colleagues, and, and go to them if they seem distressed or depressed or if they have been in some serious uh, violent situations, then they'll come and ask them, are you okay? That's the name of, of the study. And <clears throat> that's an invitation to, to talk. And maybe that is enough. If that's not enough, then there are, uh, in some situations, they use debriefing after a violent, like the Great Belt disaster with a train. They, they collect people. They have a technical debriefing, but they also have an, a psychological debriefing. And if you need more help, there are a number of uh, psychologists where you can have a number of sessions free. You don't have to report to the police, you can just activate them yourself. And uh, so these are three legs in that system. But we are investigating now if, if it works, how good it works. Because we ask them, in, in, it runs for three years, and every three months they fill, in, fill out a, a small questionnaire, and every year a larger questionnaire. Yes, yes, but yes. What are the uh, other uh, shortcomings in the Danish system or where you, where you see that... Uh, With the police? Yes. And maybe also about the courts and the other systems that uh, work with traumatized people. Yeah. Uh, one shortcoming could be that they, with the body system, they, they created this system and then it uh, deteriorated over time because there was no new energy, no new research, no kind of follow-up. So uh, the, the, the top of the police realized that some years ago, and then they've been, they worked together with the union, and the union is very strong, and <clears throat> they are interested in, in preventing uh, people breaking down and getting burned out. And if they do, they're very helpful. So you can get help through the official police system, but you can also get help through the union system because they have access to their own psychologists and to various uh, other ways of helping them. So, and those two institutions, the formal police system and the union work closely together with this project and about creating better possibilities. But they want to be aware of how big are the problems. And one thing they, they found out before we came in to start this study was, for instance, that people watching child pornography, that, that they burned out very quickly. So if you have that kind of job, <coughs> they work for two hours, and then <coughs> they uh, have other kinds of jobs, and they talk with fellow police officers that do the same thing, but they also get supervision by professionals, by psychologists, about what happens uh, in the heads and the minds of those who uh, are criminal, are, are distributing the, the pornography or using the pornography. So, so they, they learn more and more, but they also have a time to talk about their own reactions when they feel like vomiting or feel like <coughs> smashing people because they get so angry and so on. So, so they need more attention, good attention, to, to get by with this work. And of course, they are also happy when, when they succeed in it. So, and if we go back to the disaster situation and this core, I think that what should be done, but I said it costs too much money, was that we have a number of networks of people who work with crisis victims. You know Falk, the ambulance company that works in Falcon in Sweden and other places? No, it's a big ambulance company in Denmark. And they have very good psychological services. They have like 50 
psychologists who are on call for if there's uh, larger accidents, you can call them anytime uh, during the day or night, and uh, <coughs> they are very efficient. And then they have like a second row of about 300 psychologists who only are on call occasionally. But these people, they talk with, with accident victims every week, sometimes every day. So I think they're in very good shape to, to be in a disaster situation. So you can activate 350 psychologists like that within one or two days. And, but of course, they, they need cash. They, they, will, they will have a salary for their work. And the, the state, the regions don't want to pay that. So they give them a, a second-hand offer. And we don't, we don't have so many accidents, I mean, or disasters. So I think that we as a society could afford that and we could do it much better. And also they're trained in, in the follow-up because as part of their, of the, the psychology services, they follow up. So, and, and if the sessions that have there are not enough, they help the patients to, to get help other, in other places. So I think that would be much more efficient and not very, made not very expensive. But I like questions about the organization because this is very important and maybe you can use that also. Um, I have <coughs> been doing a study, this is a little advertisement, announcement, uh, on, uh, <coughs> on child abuse, child maltreatment in Denmark. There was a, a large uh, state uh, company bureau that made this interview study of 3,000 Danes asking them about uh, child maltreatment when they were children, when they were interviewed over 24 years old. After they, they published their report, I asked them, could I get the data? And then I made another analysis, based on latent class analysis, so we could see the differences between those who had experienced psychological violence, those who had experienced sexual violence, and those who had been physically violated. And then we looked at, through the registers, at the risk factors. Because we could go back to before they were born and see how their parents were doing. Were the teenage mothers, were their parents involved in criminality before they were born, were the drug addicts or things like that. So we could study that through the registers. And we could also follow them for a period of time after the, the, the study for seven years. And we, we also had survey data on how much they were maltreated and what kind of maltreatment about their criminality, about their AHD, AIDS symptoms, about uh, uh, alcohol consumption and things like that. So, and I, we have been publishing, I think, 20 articles, and this is the, the summary of all the studies. So if you want to know something about differences between different types of maltreatment, then you can read this article. What was the most interesting thing that you found out personally? <laughs> personally? That all three kinds of maltreatment are quite similar. And this is new knowledge because we are not used to, uh, to know some very much about the effects of psychological maltreatment. But the, the effects are similar to the ones of sexual maltreatment and physical maltreatment. Not quite as high in all aspects, but quite strong. And generally, there were more negative effects of those who have been physically assaulted physical maltreated as children, because this was always connected with uh, neglect and also with psychological violence. So we call them poorly victimized because they've been beaten, they've been uh, neglected or care for their health and hygiene and food, and they've also been psychologically humiliated and, and maltreated. So. And we can, and one more thing, 
that is also with the rape victim, we saw a lot of alcohol abuse among female sexual survivors. Very, very high numbers. So they try to calm themselves by getting drunk. Sad story. But uh, I think it's a very good article. <laughs> and I've been working with a number of other institutions, the Danish Stalking Center, the Mother's Aid, Women's Shelters, Dialogue Against Violence, and the Center for the Sexual Abused. We have uh, three <coughs> large centers and some satellites who work with adults who experienced incest. And I've been working with them for about 20 years. They do a lot of good work. I've been evaluating the work and analyzed a lot of problems they had. With the women's shelters, we found out that staying in a shelter in itself reduces number of PTSD quite a lot. And we made a follow-up study after three months, and we saw that the effect was still there. Now we are going, starting a project where we want to study the children who are in the women's shelters and see how bad their situation is from a psychological point of view and see if we can help them more efficiently. With the mother's aid, we did a study on mothers who were victims of interpersonal violence and had left their partner. And we showed that this was a good effect of this uh, group treatment. And with the stalking centers, we are involved now in, we have been doing a study on mothers, which showed that three quarters of them had PTSD. And the number was so high that they could be compared with terror victims and uh, refugees that has been tortured. Because if you're followed at all times by an ex-partner and you don't know what his next move is, is he going to burn down your house, smash your car, kidnap your children, call your work and say she's crazy and she's going to jail next week. Or, you know, stalkers have a lot of fancy ideas. Uh, <clears throat> so we have done this study and this has been part of that the government wants to support this stalking center. We've got a law against stalking and that's a new thing, it's one or two years old. And we also, as the first in the world, studied the children of mothers who were stalked. And we found that about half of them has PTSD. And we did the study in an age-appropriate way, uh, different uh, questionnaires and, and tests for, for different age groups. And uh, we found out that they really have a lot of problems. So I think it's great when you have the chance to study both parents and, and children and see how, uh, <coughs> how the, the problems they have uh, are, are large and, and trying to find out if you could make changes. Uh, I said before with the rape victims, we found out that the treatment didn't work. So what did the center do? They said, <coughs> we're going to make a new kind of treatment. Uh, they wanted to work trauma with trauma-focused CBT and EMDR. The psychologists here who know what it is. And, and that, that took two years of training. And they were ready to start the project. And then the leader disappeared and all the psychologists disappeared. They had very good trainings and skills now so they could move into private practice and work there. So the, the center was bombed back to the Stone Age and had to start from fresh again. That was a sad story <clears throat> because we found a problem and we wanted to solve it and we, had, we started, but then you can't control everything. Um, so, and with this group of sexual abuse, we found out that a group of about 20% are treatment resistant, a word we're not allowed to use, but they didn't profit from the treatment. And then we can go back to the, to the center, uh, leaders of the centers and said, we have identified this problem. And now we have got means to develop something for this group that doesn't profit from the ordinary treatment. So we can develop a new kind of treatment and see if that works better. Is it uh, only individual work or group work or what is the more effective uh, with uh, this group of people? S 
science shows that uh, group work is not very efficient. This is in a study from Norwegian where they combined individual and group treatment and they concluded that the group treatment didn't give anything extra. So they could take that away. But we are, we are looking for something that is efficient. And the good thing is that we have time to, to test it out and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we can try something new. But to train the psychologist to prepare the organization, the system for a new kind of treatment, that takes time. And then you have to collect data. So two, three years will go and then you hopefully are uh, no more. With the women's shelters, before we started with them, we, we discussed with the leaders there, maybe we find that there's no effect of staying in women's shelters. What would you do about that? That's a risk when you make an investigation. And they said, and I like that answer, <coughs> Uh, we would like to know it first. Before the politicians or the public would know about it, they would, because if that was the case, then they would start to think about what could we do to improve the situation. But very, very good. It turned out that the shelter stay was efficient in reducing PTSD and uh, quite a lot, and the effect continued for three months after they left the shelters. So everyone was happy about their work. Yeah, we are about to finish now. Can the ship be turned around? You know this artist? A Lithuanian a guy who made a number of funny pictures. Very strange. Um, so this is about I have experiences, some good ones, some bad ones, about doing studies, using this information, trying to change systems. And sometimes, you know, you are uh, cut, cut, get a cut back and, and you have to start over again. Or sometimes you have successes. And I think that to be successful, you have to, to be engaged, but also think about that the situation with the staff, how can you keep them engaged? Uh, I think that's very important by training, by giving them new information, by giving new goals or stronger purposes, by making them more attentive to specific problems that are not well solved by the staff. And say, we'll do more in this area or in that area. And then have some kind of measurement so you can see are there progress or are we not moving ahead? So, thanks for now. And if you want to read this chapter, you're welcome. Trauma and Critical Exposure, Critical Incident Exposure and Law Enforcement, a chapter we wrote for a book on police psychology. I'm ready for questions. Yes. If there are um, any. something similar also with the people who, uh, who want to help, help others to uh, go to the police, <laughs> who become therapists, uh, uh, but uh, they also uh, have had uh, uh, trauma uh, uh, experiences in their lives, uh, but they are coping and, uh, and this makes them also more vulnerable to uh, burnout, uh, to PTSD, The answer is no. 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 But of course there are some within the police, within psychologists, within social workers who had a hard childhood, who have experienced <coughs> life-threatening situations, who had been through a terrible divorce as a child or had a husband that has been violent and so on, or have <coughs> critical illnesses at certain times. 
And that makes many of us more mature. Some of us are, are fixated in these problems and never move forward. But many with resources can integrate those experiences and are more uh, tolerant, are more likely to work trauma-informed, are more gentle to, to victims, are more are less cynical. Um, so I think that professional training can combine with, with some kind of early trauma or, or trauma during your lifetime would make you a, a better professional. Yeah. And, uh, in their recovery from yeah. what has happened. And uh, from, from this observation, I would say that uh, uh, among the people who want to work with us, uh, there are more people who have had traumatic uh, experiences than on average. But I, I don't think that the police, uh, when they screen uh, new cadets for, uh, for the police training, that they uh, or, or do to such thing. No. There's one thing you should be aware of called pseudo altruism. Shall I spell it? It's a, a difficult word. Uh, pseudo means false altruism. And that that you see that in some voluntary organizations. There's a lot of it uh, where uh, <clears throat> some of the, the voluntary uh, workers, they use the, their voluntary work as a way of processing their own trauma. And they tell the victims, you should do this and do that because I did this and did that and that helped me and therefore it should also help you and you. So, so this is... It's not true altruism because they are trying to process their own problems because they were never processed properly. So I think that a group of volunteers in the best of all worlds, they should be supervised uh, very closely. And some of them should be taken away from their job because they mix their own problems with the problems of the clients. But of course, we also need volunteers because there are so many victims that need help. And if anyone has questions that come forward, you can write to me because on the last slide there is my email address. And you can also go into our website. There's a lot of articles. <coughs> the headlines are in Danish, but if you move a little around, you find a lot of good stuff, I think.